recorded. So if you don't want to be recorded, you probably don't want to be on this chat because we are recording it, but for a very good reason. We're recording it so that we can share it with a lot of people and hopefully help a lot of folks who are having some, some challenges. So uh, I want to welcome, welcome you to our Dementia Discussions. Dementia Discussions is hosted by Dementia Action Alliance, and we normally do this every Thursday afternoon. But we had a special one because our, our friends in Australia were saying, well, we can't get on at 3 o'clock in the morning. I said, why not? But they didn't <laughs> see it that way. So um, we decided to have a special one for our Australia friends. Okay. And today, it's really my privilege to introduce Susan Weary, Dr. Susan Weary. Um, Susan has been kind enough to come on to help us all uh, with some of the things that we're going to talk about. And mainly what we want to talk about is, boy, how is this coronavirus really impacting people living with dementia? I mean, I know it's impacting everybody, but for people living with dementia, we've heard so many people say that their balance is off and they're so stressed out that it's increasing their symptoms. So we're going to talk about how is it impacting people and how are we coping? What strategies can we put in place? So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Susan. Thank you very much, Laurie. And let me say, everyone, and Laurie in particular, I, it's such a privilege, really, to be here um, and to work so closely with uh, Dementia Action Alliance, which I just learned about about a year ago. And now I'm telling everybody I know about the organization powered by people with purpose. And uh, it's really, I, I mean it so sincerely, it's just a great uh, privilege and honor to be here with you. Um, I'm a geriatric psychiatrist by training. I've been in the field of geriatric psychiatry for over 30 years and have had a great deal of my career uh, spent working with people with, who are living with dementia or who have some other um, condition that has kind of marginalized them from society. So a good part of my career, I actually worked with people with serious and persistent mental illness, worked with people with disabilities of all kinds, and have always had a special place in my heart and in my work for older adults. And so that means I've worked a lot with people who have cognitive work disorders that disproportionately impact older adults. So my thought for tonight, and uh, after talking with Laurie, is um, to just find out what questions you have and to kind of describe the world that we are in right now so we have a, a common language um, for talking about the coronavirus. I wanna hear what your concerns are, how you're coping, get your advice that we can share with others, and then I'll share some of mine. If that will work, Laurie, we'll proceed that way. Okay. So Absolutely. So this thing, coronavirus, right, is so novel because it is very virulent. And what that means simply is that it impacts people more seriously than the common cold, although that's the family that it is part of. So the coronavirus is getting this special attention over the common cold because it's virulent, meaning more serious, because it seems to be super contagious. and um, because it's novel, we don't have any immunity built up to it. This thing you'll hear referred to as herd immunity. So if you think about it, every year at the cold and flu season, you always get advice about getting a vaccine, washing your hands, sneezing into your elbow. That's the same advice we're getting now. And the reason for that is that these cold viruses do have some things in common. But this one's different and it is requiring kind of more extreme measures in a certain way because what's been added this year, of course, is this thing called social distancing. And when I say added, I mean that the Centers for Disease Control, which is really like our big public health prevention arm of healthcare, has indicated that we need to flatten the curve. We need to spread out the time during which people are affected. We need to make sure that as few people as possible are actually infected with this virus. And so first the recommendation was 
stay, uh, no crowds of more than 250. Then it was no more than 50. Then it was no more than 10. And then it was, you know, on second thought, let's just keep a certain distance from one another and use some common sense. If you're in a football stadium with only 50 other people and you're all going for a walk around the football field, staying six feet apart, you could probably have 50 people in a football field, but you can't have 10 people in a closet. You can't have five people in a closet, right? Because we can't stay far enough from, away from one another. Because here's the other kind of tricky thing. This virus, some of us have this virus and don't even know it because people respond to viruses differently. So you might infect someone unwittingly because you have no symptoms. But the social distancing part of our public health response has created a whole new set of problems that I think are particularly difficult for people living with dementia and their care partners. Because what social distancing does, and this recommendation to stay home, is disrupt everything we do. Simple things like going to the grocery, going out to meet friends for coffee, going to church or a place of worship, or just to get together to maybe go shopping someplace else. So the social distancing aspect of this, I think, has been particularly challenging because it leads to social isolation and disruption of like the usual day. So I'd like to pause there and ask if that's been true for people on the call. Has disruption of your normal routine been a big part of this or not? It's certainly been a big part of it for me. For me, definitely. Um, I've been living with uh, frontotemporal degeneration of FTD and early onset Alzheimer's and um, any change of routine can really upset my my whole balance um, and not being able to to do the things I normally do once a week um, it it throws me off it throws me off it it gets um, gets me agitated it gets me stressed um, it, it's very difficult and that's even normal change in routine sets me off so now like every day is a change in routine so it, it's difficult it's hard um, I have a, a little a little dog that's usually with me um, and I've found that I'm I've got her with me all the time anymore just because it really helps to calm me down stroking her and holding her it's uh, very therapeutic for me right now because otherwise I, I do get agitated Thanks very much, Laurie. I think that that's uh, not an uncommon response. Would anyone else like to describe something that they're experiencing? Oh, Carol, go ahead, and then after Carol, Paul Ann. Okay, uh, my husband and I were gone. My husband has um, has uh, dementia, and we were gone to Vancouver for five weeks, and we were very careful out there and did mostly walking around. And now we've come back to Calgary, and we are um, isolated in our apartment. And uh, of course, worried about the coronavirus and we in, live in a 40 plus building and I have a cold right now, but it's impossible for us to stay separated. We're a very small apartment and I kind of worry about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think what I'd like to do, Laurie, if it's okay with you, is to respond to each question as it comes as opposed to collecting them. So Carol, here's what I'll tell you that the um, centers for Disease Control here are recommending. First of all, just simply do the best you can, okay? In other words, don't stress too much about how you can't stay apart, but even in a small apartment, kind of use common sense. Now, is it you or your husband that has the cold, did you say? I have the cold. You have the cold. Okay. So you have the cold. So um, I could put you on the spot and ask you what you're doing, but I won't. So I'll just say, here's what I hope you're doing. Okay. 
For the cold, the common cold or the big one, you really do want to be so fastidious, okay, about coughing, sneezing, laughing hard into your elbow, right? So that you don't spread any kind of viral germ, doesn't have to be corona. So coughing, sneezing, any time anything's coming out of your mouth or nose, cover it up. I am doing you that. have tissues at hand, excuse me, obviously cover, cover that as well. Um, wash your hands after every sneeze or cough or sniffle. Every time you blow your nose into a tissue, straight into the bathroom and wash your hands. It may seem excessive, but it is, has been known forever as the best protection against spreading these kind of viral germs. So can't say enough about washing your hands. Now, I'm gonna say a little tip here um, that I might repeat later on, and that is about how boring it gets to wash your hands over and over and over. So I, um, I wash my hands a lot, uh, both for my own protection and the protection of those that I'm with. But it does get really old. And so I was thinking to myself, wow, you know, if you don't find something to do while you're washing your hands, pretty soon boredom is going to override good judgment. So I've started using my hand washing time, which is supposed to be 20 seconds, right? right. To practice my deep breathing. Because deep breathing, which we'll do at the end of this program or towards the end, is one of the best things we can all practice now. Because when you have a cold or when you're stressed, the natural body response is to trigger what we call the sympathetic nervous system, right? So it, it jacks us up. And a deep breath engages a different part of the nervous system. So to recount, sneeze in your elbow or sneeze in a tissue every time into the bathroom, wash your hands. While you're washing your hands, three deep breaths, which we'll practice later. The other thing that you can do is if there are common surfaces that you and your husband um, touch a lot, is to really wipe them down. And if you um, haven't been able to get any of that hand sanitizer stuff, there's a, there are um, dilution um, uh, suggestions on the CDC website, like how much bleach to put in a quart of water, and just wipe things down. Your doorknobs, your handles. And here's the thing, Carol, you, you're going to need to do it every day. It might help you feel better to know that you're doing everything that you can, but also rest assured you've been sharing germs for a while. And as a married couple is all I mean. And you're probably not exposing him in any more serious way, I guess is the, the way that I would put that. Don't share food. Um, and now you tell me how you're already doing all of that and, and what else you're doing. Well, I sing happy birthday two times. <laughs> Every time I wash my hands, my oh. hands are almost um, just about dried up because no skin left on them from washing so much. I did look online how to make, because I, I had some Lysol cleaner, but I don't anymore. So I learned, went this morning and they said how much uh, bleach. They said half a teaspoon in one of those little spray bottles. So oh, that's excellent. what it did. Yeah, so I did that, and I've been trying to wipe the counters off, and you know, and most of me, it's me who has to do the make the food and stuff. So I am, you know, washing my hands before I cook, and every time I give them a plate and so forth. So I'm trying. <laughs> you, Carol, you're doing more than trying. You are succeeding. That's terrific. And thanks for the tip for the rest of us about. Tell me again now how much it is one teaspoon in a spray bottle. It said half a teaspoon in in a quart. That's what it Half said. A teaspoon in a quart. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you very much. And then the only other thing I would say in terms of kind of um, being in there together, isolation does not mean you can never go outside your door. 
Right. Okay. And getting some fresh air for both of you. Now, maybe what you'll want to do is to go outside six feet apart, okay? Or maybe you'll want to go out one at a time. I don't know exactly what your apartment building is like, but you know, schedule it with your neighbors so you're all walking around the the building at different times because it, I this is one um, confusion I think is that people think they have to be locked indoors. They really don't. Isolation means that you stay away from other people, but not staying away from nature. Right. That'll we, be part of what heals you. We have been going for walks, and now it, it snowed in Calgary yesterday, and we have ice underneath the snow. So that is kind of a scary thing. So we do have a walking tape. Um, I go onto YouTube, and I've been making my husband walk a mile, and I've been walking too. So we've been doing that, and we wait till 10.30 at night and go for a walk out in the hallways. Uh, so we've been doing that. You are, you are so on top of this. You're given the next talk. I don't know. It's kind of, uh, I think I'm getting quite grumpy and, you know, getting tired of repeating things and doing that. So, yeah, I think that it'll be nice when we'll be able to, it warms up and we can go outside for much longer. Yeah. You know, grumpy is understandable, reasonable, and okay. It's okay yeah. to be a little grumpy. It's, it's just a feeling. It will pass. And like all Strong's feelings, it passes pretty quickly. So no need to apologize for grumpy. We're probably all a little grumpy these right days. Now. Yep. Then we let it go. Someone else I think was going to comment or had a question before, Lori? Um, Paul Ann, you were next. And let me just say, Carol, I'm glad you brought up about the singing because I saw that posted on Facebook and it said that also motivates you. So pick a song that motivates you, that makes you happy, so that we keep our motivation up as well. So if happy birthday motivates you, go for it. Um, Paul Ann. Hi, Susan. One of the things that I'm having trouble with is the grandchildren. Um, they, for one thing, my daughter is, no, is working and the grandchildren are home. So they're, they're in a separate part of the house and I can kind of keep distance, you know, that way. But I think she kind of is expecting me to be kind of checking on them and work, you know, you know, making sure everything's going fine throughout the day. And I have COPD and I've had it for years and I'm on oxygen so at night when I'm down. So I'm very concerned, you know, about staying away. I know the one sniffling, you know, and running nose and everything. Poem, may I? Yeah, Poem, how old are your grandchildren? Um, 11 and 12. And are they pretty, um, are they pretty savvy with the internet? Uh, one of them is. Okay. So could that one, while they're in the other room, you obviously are um, a, like a Zoom expert. Um, I wonder if you could um, have a game sort of, of um, being in touch with each other as if you're on a spaceship where they're staying in the other room and you're Zooming to each other. If you have an iPad each or you have a computer, I, I don't want to assume what, you know, kind of what people have, but I have an 11 year old niece lives in another state and um, her school is closed as well. And she has aspirations of being a teacher. So she has set up a virtual classroom for herself and her friends. Um, and they are learning together online. But what particularly touched me about, um, her classroom is that she found this little um, animated GIF, this ghost hugging itself. And, um, and because she's from a hugging family, right? And they can't touch and trying to learn this social distance, she's sending everybody she knows ghost hugs mm -hmm. and, uh, and got it as part of this animation. So I really appreciate your dilemma. You don't want them to get you sick. You have COPD. You don't want your, your um, daughter sounds like she wants you to keep an eye on them in some way. 
But I'm wondering if you can keep an eye in a way that allows them to learn about this six foot social distancing and have a light touch about it. That's why I was saying spaceships and, and, and you know, and iPads. Kind of like when I was a kid, I loved those walkie talkies. You know, you just, they right. only had a range of two rooms apart, but it seemed so techy. And, uh, and so something like that, I, I think what you all will hear me say throughout this is that part of, part of combating our stress, because our stress response is a normal response to the degree of uncertainty that is in our world right now. And so we need to kind of actively, we need to activate a lighter touch. And I think that's why I try to find the ways to do things that also are a little bit playful, not to minimize anything, but rather to say, this is really serious. So we got to find a way to deal with it that we can keep dealing with it that way with a lighter touch. Now, I don't know, Pollan, if I answered your question actually enough. Um, tell yeah. me if any of that helps and uh, what other thoughts you might have. No, that helps. I, I, think, I think one of the things I'm battling with my daughter is she, she is not afraid of this virus and doesn't seem to share this fear. And she doesn't seem to think that, you know, doesn't understand why this is a big thing. My kids aren't sick, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I guess I just have to um, try to explain to her my feelings. Well, you know, that's a, that's a great response. I think that if she's not able to take it seriously for the community at large, um, then maybe she can take it seriously for you by letting her know your feelings. Because I have a lot of people like that in my life who say, I'm not sick. And I say, great. That's going to allow you to be helpful to others who might get sick. <laughs> now, keep your distance. You know, it's. Um, I, I'm glad that peop more people aren't sick. That's super. But, but that's not the same as saying we don't have a, a problem in our community, right? So, but it sounds like letting her know how you feel will be a big, big part of it. I think so. Thank you. Okay. Do we have other questions? Um, anybody? And raise your hand. No, it's a quiet group today. How about, how are you doing, how are you coping with the changes? Um, how are you coping with uh, having to fight to get a roll of toilet paper when you go to the store? I mean, really, um, how are you coping with all the major changes going on in all of our societies? Anybody have a thought on that? Hi. Are you on shutdown yet? way down the south in New Zealand, in Dunedin. And um, I don't have dementia, but I work for Alzheimer's New Zealand. So I'm sort of tuning in because you're a step ahead of us and I'm looking for things that I can um, perhaps pick up that I can use to support people in New Zealand. So forgive me for the intrusion, but I hope you see the reason why. Um, it, it is very, very early and we haven't had a lot of feedback yet. I think people are just becoming accustomed to what is happening. Um, personally, I had one outburst by, from somebody um, today, actually, this morning when I was out walking my dog who was really, really angry at me because I was concerned about her husband who has um, a, a very bad respiratory condition. And I'd suggested that um, perhaps, you know, I could come and help them and do shopping and that sort of thing for him. And, and um, I, I'd said that to them yesterday. And today she'd obviously reflected on that and got it all confused. And today she was really angry at me because I had um, suggested that he might be a risk to other people. And I had no right to do that. So I think we're just really in the very early stages of people um, getting information, sorting out that information. And um, it's, it's, we're, we're in the beginning stages of the hoarding. The supermarkets are under enormous stress. 
Um, all the things that, you know, you are a step ahead of us well and truly. And we've put lots of things in place to hopefully we don't get to the extent that, that you are over there. Um, but it's still a very, very challenging time. And I know our dementia community are really, really concerned about how it's going to impact on them. So thank you for sharing, but I, I don't really have anything that I can contribute. I'm here to learn. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here, Lynetta. And thank you particularly for speaking. I love the way New Zealanders <laughs> speak. I, I um, at a certain point in my career, just uh, three years ago, I, I took a, a belated gap year because I had never had one in my 20s. And, uh, and I went to New Zealand and um, just hiked and traveled uh, through both the South and, and the North. And I absolutely adore your country and your prime minister. So, um, you know, I think there is a way in which um, we can learn something from you. And I hope you do. we do have something um, uh, to learn from us. I hope we have some things that are helpful. But what I'm so impressed by in, from the uh, countrywide approach um, is the recognition from the get-go that it requires a countrywide approach. You know, it's kind of a recognition that we're in this together. And, um, and that and if we are in it together, we will be more successful. Now, that doesn't mean that human nature doesn't still rise up. That's my toilet paper or my family needs it more. It's not that I think, it, you know, it, it, any place really has this mastered. But the truth of the matter is, I think um, those of us who cope with stress um, differently, maybe with a lighter touch, can maybe cut some slack to people who um, are, are more stressed, right? Because um, the, the short fuse uh, phenomenon, I, I really get. These are such hard and uncertain times. And if I were to say anything to you as you sort of um, help people in the dementia community, people living with dementia um, that, that you work with, is to have them start thinking about it now kind of an alternate plan. You know, I think Laurie spoke before about some things that she typically does that she cannot now do. And I know that, um, you know, one of those for many people that I know is simply going shopping. That there's a habit and a ritual and a routine of going to do the marketing or the shopping or whatever on, uh, say, a Monday or whatever. And, um, and now, it's not so certain that, that can be done. So to the extent that you have a little time that you can buy, I would say help people do the following. Anticipate what modifications in their plan might need to be made and write them up now and save them. Extend the support network. I think this is something you know that, um, you know, that Carol's alluding to as well. You know, she and her husband are kind of in it together right now in their apartment. So, you know, is there a neighbor comfortable with six foot rules or whatever it's going to be um, who can trade off so that the care partner or the person living with dementia can get away from each other, go for a walk separately, right? So to plan in advance, how can you broaden those um, circles of support within the natural supports. Um, you know, one of the things that's happening here in our, um, uh, our aging services is that many of our um, service providers are older people themselves. So for example, delivering Meals on Wheels, one of our, one of our home delivery food programs, um, is serviced by people over the age of 65 because we're the people who are retired, right? And so um, by and large, obviously not everyone. And, and now they're afraid or their doctors are recommending they not volunteer, right? So that, I just think it's like good anticipation and planning because the, the at-risk populations, so to speak, have been supporting each other so you want to broaden those natural uh, circles, I think, uh, in advance. 
And um, those are just two things that came to mind when I was thinking about it on a population uh, level that uh, might be helpful. Thank you. Yes, what we are, we're certainly um, one of our um, initial um, drives, I guess, has been to get people developing their own emergency plans. Excellent. And, and it's a support plan. It's not just context and that. It's much more. It's about what makes things, what makes my day normal. You know, what, what, keeps, what keeps things normal and safe for me. And so we're helping people to develop those. And then the next thing we're doing is prioritising our communities as to which um, people have got lots of networks, family, friends that they can call on. But there's always those people that don't have those networks. So right. how can put supports in for them. So that's really where we've got to at the moment. But I think your advice about looking at what are the habits, the rituals, and, and planning for how you can manage those, perhaps put some other things in place is really, really good. So thank you for that. I'll carry that forward. You're welcome. You. You're welcome. I, I see three people here living with dementia. That's myself, Pollyanne, and True. Is anybody else living with dementia that's on this call currently? Oh, okay. Well, we're glad that, that you joined us because hopefully we're going to help each other learn from each other a lot. Um, True, I see you have a question. Well, I, um, I don't know that it's a question. I have gotten to where I don't remember to wash my hands. I've got chickens. And my husband is continually saying, did you wash your hands? 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 And <laughs> it's kind of aggravating for all of us. <laughs> and, but um, now, yes, it's more on my mind to wash my hands because, you know, because, well, actually, now I have two friends with dementia that have had, have got a diagnosis of the virus. Mm. Um, so it's much more on my mind to wash my hands. But it, it's, I think that those of us that have symptoms that can be a problem. Yes, I've washed my hands all my life, but then we moved and I didn't have a sink in the bathroom. Mm -hmm. So all that stuff went out the window for a year because the sink was somewhere else, you know, and so the habit didn't stick. And um, I think that, anyway, that's another thought. Thank you, True. Um, May I ask, what, what techniques do you now use uh, when you want to remember something? Okay. Are, you a, are you a post-it note person or a list <laughs> person? <laughs> well, I'm assistant administrator for Dementia Mentors. So uh, I've got loads and loads of different techniques that I used for different things, and they work for a while, and then they don't work anymore. Mm -hmm. that, you know. The same way I can't, I can't cook anymore. I can't, what was it you said? Was there any, oh, I can't go shopping. Um, I can't do the numbers anymore. But it sounds like what you can do is to help um, mentor others. That's one thing you're still doing, yes? Yes. Okay. And, um, and, and, you know, I don't know what will work best for you, but one tip I would have for your husband, if he's worried about, did you wash your hands? Is, am I about to see him? Hi, husband. I think you're about to be brought into the conversation. So my, only suggestion, my only suggestion would be, um, hello, husband. Hello. Um, hey, hi. Hello, hello. You know, I was just going to say to True that the question, did you wash your hands of somebody who has, who's living with dementia, may be a frustrating question. <laughs> if, what you, 
if what you want is for her hands to be washed and it comes to your mind, then I would say, could we go wash our hands together? I don't remember the last time I washed mine or let's go wash our hands. Because I think when we ask people, did you do something? One, it's always an annoying question whether you have, whether you're living with dementia or not. Did you remember to take out the trash? Did you turn out the lights? Did you, it always makes us feel like, well, we didn't do something, right? So, so the did you question I find uh, can be not very helpful, but, but it, it's great that you want True to wash her hands. It's great that you're washing your hands. I'm glad you all are um, so attentive to it, particularly if you have chickens. <laughs> um, and um, because it is the thing that will help you stay healthy, particularly if you already know that the um, virus is in your community. You have friends who have it, you said. Two friends, I think? Yeah, they're online. They're online friends. Yeah. Okay, super. Um, um, the closest virus that we have is probably 60 miles away. Is 60 miles away. Okay, well, that's super. Let's keep it away. <laughs> keep those hands clean. Um, and um, avoid the did you question. It would just be a, like a little thought to save the annoyance. And when, you, when it comes to mind like, oh, I'm kind of worried maybe True did, didn't wash her hands, just go wash them together. Sing Happy Birthday or some other favorite song. Um, my medical students were telling me one today called Africa. Um, it's played, it's some band. I meant to look it up. It's a, a lot hipper, they said, than telling everybody to sing happy birthday. but And they thought my suggestion of deep breathing was totally boring, um, but um, I think it's a great stress reliever. But do something fun while you wash your hands together. And uh, I'm glad you're paying so much attention to it. I just can't stress it enough. Could I make an observation? Oh, please, sir. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Drew and I went for blood tests today. Uh, I was really not thrilled with going to the hospital and was even less thrilled after I got there and saw their protocols. But what I did find out, at least for our local hospital, is after lunch, the number of blood draws at the lab goes way down. Right now. So, you know, most people, or many people do fasting blood draws. So that means first thing in the morning, they're crammed in there. Mm -hmm. When we got there, we were the only ones. And only one person showed up during our time frame. And that was at 1.30. So beyond that, it might be good just simply to call the lab and find out if there is a slow time. So you're not sitting around or standing with... 15 or 30 other people. That's a great tip, is so, to really call ahead. I think that's really smart. Thank you. Uh -huh. And I hope you didn't mind my teasing you about that did. No, 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 no. Okay. Other, other thoughts? Taffy, I saw your hand up, but True, I also put a note in the chat that I started placing the soap on my keyboard because not that I'm ever on my computer, but <laughs> that, that kind of reminded me because it's sitting right on my, on my keyboard as a reminder. So um, Taffy, you had your hand up. So there you go, Taffy. <laughs> well, I, I, I must say this was just all an experiment for me because I've never been on Zoom before or anything like this. So um, probably when I put my hand up, I was just trying to see what was going on. It has been interesting. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, I'm not calling. I'm calling to learn as much as I can. My 56 year old daughter-in-law has early onset Alzheimer's. Mm. Um, I, she lives about 20 minutes away. They have a pretty good program for her. She's still driving locally. Um, she was a teacher. She loves kids in the mornings. She works volunteers in a preschool. So her mornings are taken up. The afternoons, um, one, one Monday afternoon a month, I spend time with her. My son just set up a program with her where somebody comes Tuesday and Thursday afternoons just for the company. When she's alone, she's very depressed. Well, right now, we're in California. Um, uh. I, 
I'm here in a senior facility. I'm doing okay. We're doing okay. We can go out for walks. We see each other in the hall. I keep thinking to myself, oh, so my point being that all of her programs are over. And when she has nothing to do, she's very depressed. So I worry about her. My, my son now is working from home. So he's there, but he's working. So anyway, there's nothing... Um, I can call her, but language is difficult, so phone calls are hard. Uh, I can text her, which sometimes she looks at and sometimes she doesn't. So mostly this for me was I've never been on Zoom. It was my son that sent me the information. He knows that I am trying to learn everything I can so that when I'm with her, I'm appropriate and know what's going on. So this was kind of fun. <laughs> Well, Taffy, you know, I have to say, uh, I, I may have already said it on the call, what I'm so impressed by in this um, pandemic is how much creativity it has unleashed and how much people are willing to try new things, like yourself, never on this thing called Zoom. Right. Whereas and Lori's I like, oh, I've been doing it for years. Yeah. Okay. But... I, I love it. You wouldn't believe how many of my fellow faculty, other physicians, my age, I'm in my 60s, um, who don't like technology as much as I do. And for many of them, it's their first Zoom. And now all of our medical school teaching is going to be online for the rest of the semester. We cannot have our students come into contact with patients. We can't have our students come into contact, particularly with older adults, where a lot of their training is. And so faculty are learning a whole new way of teaching and like yourself. I, I want Laurie though to tell you about the great resources if you haven't seen them already on the website DAA Now um, because um, uh, your daughter may be able to enjoy many of them if he can set her up. Laurie, would you uh, tell her about that great list you're accumulating? Sure. Um, Taffy, first, I, I want to tell you that if you would like to learn how to Zoom with her, now that you can't go over and visit her, I would be more than happy to help you. My son um, I mean, he's the, he's the IT guy. <laughs> he's the IT guy? He's the okay. IT. Yeah, so um, good idea. I, I know he can, he can set that up. Um, and... Um, and that way you can just go on and even check on her every day because he can set it up so that every day at say eight o'clock, just pick a number, um, she clicked on and the two of you go on Zoom together. Um, or if you have an iPhone, um, do you have the iPhone? Yeah, FaceTime. Okay, um, a, a lot, I, I know a couple of the people that I, that I mentor, prefer doing it on, um, what's it called, Face, FaceTime. FaceTime. So yeah. that's, that's also an option. So if the person is, depend on, on how much their dementia is impacted, if the person is um, more accustomed to using FaceTime, just set up a, an appointment every single day or three times a week where you do FaceTime. In addition to that, um, if you go into our website, and I'm going to put Put it here so everybody has it. Ah, I spelled it wrong. Yeah, okay, now it's right. Sorry. I haven't spelled that enough, I guess. Um, if you go into that, uh, we oh, have on I'll, there. I'll share the screen for you. Go ahead. Thank you, Karen. Um, on here, this is a, a discussion that we taped yesterday, and the one from today will be on there also. And then Karen, go to the one that shows all the, there you go, fun things to do while stuck at home. Hmm. And this is just some of the ideas of things that you can do at home. Now, if the person is into exercising, yes. um, if they go to spiro100.com, uh, that gives you exercising to do at home. Okay. She actually goes out for a bike ride every day and uh, she has some friends, she was a teacher and schools are closed now. She does have some, I mean, she's very active. She has some friends that go on a hike with her. But I like the idea, I'm, my, my son actually FaceTimes with her, with me at night, but the idea of me doing it alone with her in the day, I think that's a good idea. And I know she does FaceTime with the psychologist 
um, once a month because the Mondays that I'm with her, we have to be back by a certain time. So she knows how to do that. But that's good because I was only thinking of calling her and that doesn't work because of language. But um, setting up a FaceTime, is, that would be great. Yeah, because that way, and, and it sounds to me like she, she already is familiar with FaceTime. Um, that way, uh, if you have it every day, then um, your son can put it on her calendar. And it, so every day she knows that that's, or every other day, whatever, whatever time frame you pick, um, as someone living with dementia, it's going to be easier for her to have a routine that she's familiar with. Right. And that's what she had. That's now, <laughs> that's now not. Yeah. Yeah. I know. And maybe yeah, even, reason. sorry, go ahead. Maybe even her husband can show her how to get to the Spiro 100. So yeah, she's already, she might still be biking or walking, but if she was used to heavier type exercising, um, that might help her to, to get more involved in, in exercising like she was accustomed to. Okay, this was, this was fun for me. I mean, <laughs> oh, good. 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 Susan, I'm sorry, I'll turn it back over to you. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Um, yeah, I was just going to say that, you know, just to underscore that point, as Taffy said, th this to me has been one of the hardest things um, in my community here in Maine um, about people living with dementia who had services, who had programs, who actually are living quite well with dementia because of their access to resources, and that's all shut off. And that, honestly, we didn't really anticipate as well as we might have. You know, we, and we, we sort of did and then anticipated the impacts of social isolation, but not in a really like concrete way of how do you get your groceries or how do you get your exercise if the people that you've relied on can, can't leave their home? I mean, it's, but, but, um, that then just becomes making a plan, right? Is, and recognizing that we can't replace everything. So we asked the person, of all the things you did in a week, what was your favorite? And let's focus on getting that one done first. And as soon as we figure out a plan for your favorite, then we'll move into your second favorite. And we, we just have to cut ourselves some slack, you know? Um, it, it's, um, Yes, it's, you know, uh, it's challenging and challenging for all of us. And, um, and so I deal with my frustration with the limitations of the system by, you know, recognizing that we can tackle those limitations one day at a time until we've eliminated them. And, um, and so that's a, just kind of a strategy. Well done, True. I noticed you coughed right in your elbow. And I was hoping nobody noticed how many times I touched my face. I'm trying to. Oh, no. yeah. Hey, yeah, looking back on last night's video, I keep go doing the same thing. Like, Karen, you had your hand up next. I did because I wanted to um, give a shout out to a wonderful um, resource. Susan, Dr. Berry has written this wonderful blog, uh, What to Do in These Stressful Times. And it is short to the point. Um, poignant and um, has a lot of really good tips um, such as um, limit your daily intake of news. You know, you might want to check it a couple times a day, but don't, you know. Um, I also love uh, that some of the best sources of online information are CDC and World Health Organization. I mean, you can search the internet all day long, but really CDC has everything you need. So we will have that blog posted up on our website um, tomorrow. So you can thank look for that for good resources as well. No, thank you for writing it. Yeah, no, I'm glad to, glad to have it shared. What other things are on your mind? Well, everybody's thinking about that. Um, I just put my email address in the chat box. Does everybody see the chat box? Chat. So in there, you'll see the, the um, link for our website, which is daanow.org. And then the second thing that you'll see is dementiadays at gmail.com. 
That's my email. The reason I put that in for everybody is we do have dementia discussions once a week. We don't always talk about um, the coronavirus. We talk about things like um, how to collect, how to select a Medicare um, plan and um, how to cope with stress and, and how finding laughter in spite of crisis and all kinds of fun things like that. Um, and that's every Thursday at one o'clock Eastern time. If you would like to be added to the notifications where you, we send you an email um, so that you can, we'll tell you this week our topic is whatever. Um, if you send me an email and ask me to add you to the dementia discussions, I'd be more than happy to do that. And I'll give you an example. Um, next week, um, our discussion is on the challenges of relocating. Um, so for people that are in the process of relocating, we have two people actually that have relocated and uh, one of them is going to be talking to us. There is a possibility we're gonna change that topic, but send me an email and I'll let you know uh, what it is. Okay, um, okay, so I did my little spiel. Um, questions? I just wanna thank Susan so much for, for taking the time out to, to spend with us. I know you have a busy schedule and I really appreciate it. You're most welcome, Pauline. It's really, I mean, it really is great to be here. Um, thank you, Paula and Susan. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I do want to mention something. Um, Lynetta, you probably haven't faced this in New Zealand yet, and maybe some of you have and some of you haven't. Uh, on our chat yesterday, we had some people that, that were very sad um, because the one woman, um, she's having her first grandbaby and her daughter's having issues, and she can't be there with her. And that was hard for her to accept that she can't be there with her daughter and see her, her new grand, grandbaby. Um, and another, another woman who, who was on, um, her mom is on hospice, she's in a care facility and dying, and it's gonna be any day. But you know what, in the United States anyway, in most care facilities, they're not letting anybody come in, nobody. So that's really hard. So think of that as you're thinking of, of other people and what they're going through. And if you know anybody that has somebody that where their loved one is in a care facility, reach out to them and just say hi, call them, whatever, because they are going through a tough time right now. Yeah, I, I really appreciate you uh, t talking about that on the on the personal level. Just acknowledging the the sadnesses, the losses, the weddings that are being missed, the funerals that aren't happening, the opportunities for collective mourning. You know, as a culture, there are things that we're used to doing together that we can't, and mm -hmm. um, it's really hard. Uh, what I would say also at a policy level, uh, it sounds like Lynette, you're part of an organization is to anticipate um, some of the policies that could be modified at the get-go. For example, the compassionate care visits and to find ways to allow one family member at a time. What our local hospitals are doing, the initial no visitors policy at, um, in the ICU and then it was no visitors in the nursing homes are now visitors one at a time, after washing their hands, after going through you know, processes, um, can go in and visit. And I would say from the beginning, an informed policy will allow that. But I just heard about today, for those who are lucky enough to have um, families living in a facility on the first floor, they're visiting through the window and not like sneaking around the back, but um, you know, six feet away from the window, come to the window, we can at least say hello. And, you know, people are getting creative because the desire to be with a particular person is so strong. And um, so if you can anticipate some of those and get them the sort of um, the, the waivers in place before you have to learn the hard way like we did, that would be a, that would be a gift to your country. Um, 
Uh, before we stop, because it is getting very close to time, I believe, Laurie, um, I just want to think if there are any other tips I have for you. Um, as uh, Karen mentioned, I did put some together in writing, so you can get those on um, the daanow.org website. And Karen thinks they're helpful. I, I hope you'll find them helpful. Um, the one that I don't think I have in there is the importance of sleep. And um, I think I'm gonna write, um, uh, write I, not I think, I'm in the process of writing something up, again, short and sweet about sleep because sleep is so disrupted. Um, with this degree of uncertainty, the, the body's natural reaction is to throw us into high alert. So we're more vigilant because we're being told to be vigilant. We're watchful because we're being told to be watchful. We're washing our hands. We're doing all these things that are unusual. And so the message that we keep sending to our body is um, stay awake, stay alert. And it really makes sleeping hard. So a couple of things. Um, I really encourage everybody with and without dementia to um, try to reestablish a sleep routine as best you can. Going to bed at the same time every night and to make your wherever you sleep, you know, kind of a comfortable cave. Um, by which I mean keep the temperature a little bit cooler and keep it very dark. Then that signals to your body, oh, it's okay to relax now. I'm into my safe cave. It's a little cooler, kind of matching the body's temperature as it, as it relaxes. And then go through a series of, of um, progressive relaxation, whether it's squeezing your fist tight or around a little ball, but something where you really squeeze and then let go, really squeeze and then let go, like from toe, head to toe or toe to head, tensing every muscle and then letting it go. I personally like to do it in bed. You can do it by the side of your bed. You can do it before you go to the bedroom, but do it because what we have to do is override this stress response. Second thing, some people like to take a warm bath some people like a warm drink, but for older adults, taking a warm drink at bedtime guarantees a trip to the bathroom in the middle of the night. So I say, have your warm liquid like sort of around supper time. <laughs> Try to empty your bladder before you go to bed, start doing those exercises. And then I really would um, like to encourage everybody to do the kind of um, deep breathing that we call belly breathing. You put one, we'll do it right now to sign off. We'll put one hand on your belly, one hand on your chest, and you breathe in deeply, blowing out your abdomen as if there were a balloon in there, and then expelling it. Belly goes in, chest goes out, do it again. Hold it for a second if you can and then let it out. Then if you're feeling really ambitious, you can put the hand on the abdomen, hand on your chest. This time, lift your shoulders all the way up to your ears. Hold it really tight. And when you let it out, you're gonna let a sigh. <sighs> now, we have just faked our brains into thinking that we're calm. Because what we've done is to activate the parasympathetic nervous system. And so tense, breathe, go to bed, get a good night's sleep. Because tomorrow is uh, gonna be another interesting day. And get outside, get some sun in the daytime hours. We wanna keep giving our body mind the signal, we're okay, we got this. We're in it together and we want to override that stress response with our body's natural inclination towards health. Care Partners, it allows you to be able to help those living with dementia, those living with dementia. It helps you live well with dementia and also take care of others as Laurie has demonstrated here tonight. So those are my closing tips, but breathe, light heart, and let us know, like, and Lori, let me know if it would be helpful to do something like this again.
Thank you, Susan. Um, first, I want to say hi to Craig. And Craig, I'm wondering if maybe you got the time messed up. But um, thank you so much for coming on. And before we sign off, um, do you? We were talking about the impact of the virus on dementia. Do you have anything you'd want to say about that? How How are you coping with all the changes in routine and? Um, sorry about that. I forgot you guys are Eastern time. Um, I know. I thought that's what happened. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, Greg, you can hang out for a while longer if you like. <laughs> oh, that's okay. I got to say the anxiety is causing me some, or the situation is causing me some anxiety, uh, a little trouble sleeping and stuff, but I'm in, doing okay for the most part. I'm more worried about my mom than anything. She's in a assisted living facility and they're locked down to their rooms now, but they can go out one at a time a day and walk the halls, but I'm worried how she's going to fare in all this because she's 92. Yeah, Craig, um, uh, let me ask. Um, so she's in lockdown um, in her room. She goes out uh, to the corridor to take a walk. Does she have a window in her room or is she allowed to go? Uh, I mean, are they going outside at all? Yeah, fortunately, she's got a window in her bedroom and in her living room, and she got a nice view of a little pond with ducks and geese and stuff in it. So um, she's she's good off that way. And we, we already instructed her not to, she doesn't have dementia or anything, so it's a good thing. And we instructed her not to touch anything when she's out in the hall to keep her hands on her walker. So I think she'll do okay that way, but just mentally, I don't know what it's going to do to her. Yeah, how, how are you able to stay in contact with her? Um, I have that Facebook portal. It's kind of like we're doing now, but it's a it's a, just a one little computer screen that you talk back and forth on. Mm -hmm. So it's nice to have that in person. And then tomorrow I'm thinking about driving out by her and actually going outside her room and talking on the phone through the, through the window because I think she'd get a kick out of that. You know, we were just talking about that right before you got on. I, I think it's I think it's a great idea because it is kind of fun, right? It's different. It's like what kids might do to figure out how do you get to see your friend who's grounded? You sneak around the back of the house, you go to their window, okay, and you have a chat. And, um, and so I'm glad you and your mom are figuring those things out. A and I appreciate that you're worried about her, but there are so many things that you and she can do to, um, make it less likely or to offset the anxiety and the, and the depression. These are hard times. There's no way around that. And, and I think sometimes just acknowledging it, acknowledging that it's sad. As Laurie was talking before you came on about, you know, people um, with their first grandchild or new, new babies in the family and being separated or not being able to go to weddings. And that's, you know, we don't have to put a happy face on things. It's okay to be sad and, and to be worried. It's just that we don't want to stay there. We want to say, this is hard and so on. And um, she's lucky to have you to be this concerned about her. M may I ask, does she like to write at all? Does she have, has she ever kept a journal or, <clears throat> excuse me, um, uh, spoken into a, a microphone to record her stories? No, she never done that at all. Do you think she might like to? I can ask her. I can tell her that I tell her that I journal. Maybe that will spark something in her. Yeah, give her a, give her a prompt. Ask her to tell you something about her life that you don't currently know. Tell me, you know, just have her tell a story. And the reason I say that is, in times like this pandemic, we have to again be creative in ways to keep. It's not to keep our minds off the pandemic. It's to remind us that there are other things in life. It's not like distraction. It's just like acknowledgement. And so um, stories are a way that people have of making meaning of things and also reminding themselves about their identities. So I encourage a lot of people just to write down their stories, particularly, you know, if your mom, obviously she's older and, um, She's lived through a lot, you know, people who are, my 96 year old mother is, um, 
I won't say that she's indifferent to this, but she does kind of have, I've seen it all kind of attitude um, because her life was actually hard. And, and she reminds herself in this that she's, she's made it through a lot. And so I think it's oftentimes helpful to remind our mothers um, of their strengths as well. And what, one way you can remind a mother of her strength is asking her for advice, even if you have no intention of taking it. Okay. Um, and Al, Al pointed out something that he had heard uh, yesterday, and I loved it. Here we are, basically little teeny boppers in the scheme of life. These people that are in their 90s, they've been through Holocaust. They've been through uh, 9-11. This is easy peasy. So instead of us saying to them, hey, why don't you try this? We should be saying to them, okay, how did you survive and help me figure it out? Because by now you're a pro. So take advantage of the insight of, of the, I hate to say older people, but that's what they are. The people that have much more mature years than we do, because boy, they've been through a heck of a lot more than we have, I think. Now, um, I, since a lot of people with dementia have issues with noise, uh, we do a sign language clap, uh, which is, this is your sign language clap. So I particularly want to say, Susan, thank you for giving up your time. Oh, time well spent. Thank you all for all sharing right. your ideas. And for everybody else, thanks for coming. It was great seeing you. I hope we get to see you on another Dementia Discussions. Survive so we 